Good morning. Thank you for joining us online. We're excited to share what God is doing in our midst, and we want to keep you up to date with the following announcements. Lockdown is a time of prayer. Unity lies within the power to hear the same thing from God. Join us during this lockdown time to pray every morning at 6, only for 20 minutes on Zoom, or on Monday nights for intercession from 8 to 9 p.m. Our ministry is funded by the generous giving of our members and friends. Kindly support this ministry by giving towards our cause. We are all affected by the current circumstances, but sadly some are more affected than others in this difficult time. Please help us to help those in need by giving towards our BodySurf account. Good day, Chauffeur London. It's good to spend some time with you. I can't see you, but hopefully you can see me and you can hear me. And we can share the message this afternoon, what God wants to bring to us. You could see it just now on the first slide where it says, trust me. And the me is written with a capital. It's God speaking. God's speaking to us today. And God's saying, trust me. Do not trust what the world is saying. Do not trust what the people around are saying. But trust me. I am the creator. I am God. Trust me. Put your trust in me. Before we're going to carry on, I'm going to first pray. And then we can hear what God wants to share with us today. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for the opportunity that we can use techniques, techniques that we can speak to each other, that we can share the message, and that we can also hear what is on your heart, what you want to share with us today, Father. And we give you all the honor, and we give you all the glory. You are the creator of heaven and earth, who loves your creation, so much so that you've sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins, that you've sent your Holy Spirit, Father, that we can experience that here on earth. And thank you, Father, that we can hear your message, that we can hear, that we can have a heart-to-heart -heart connection with you, Father, that it's not about what other people are saying, but that we can hear what you want to share with us today. We thank you for that opportunity. And Father, we bind whatever there is, what the enemy is trying to do, who is trying to distract us, or we've got certain things in our head, from a news bulletin or from whatever message we read or seen or heard just now. We want to hear what you've got, Father, because you've got something which has got eternal value. And that's why we want to put our trust in you, Father. Thank you that we can cancel whatever wants to distract us, that we can bind it in the name of Jesus Christ, that we can hear what you want to share with us in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's a strange time, very strange, that I've got to record a message here in South Africa at the moment for you people in London. We are not where we are supposed to be in the Netherlands. We're still in a lockdown over here and hopefully at the end of next week the situation will change so that we can return back to the place where God has placed us. But we can still use technology, we can send messages, encourage each other in the awesome God in whom we put our trust. When we came over here with Bernard and Daniel and with the kids at home, we were not quite sure what was going to happen actually. And we've been doing a few things which is maybe a little bit strange, awesome things. Like in the morning, we can worship together, we can pray together, we can pray for you people in London, for the Shafa people, for the world, for leaders. We can bring them all to God and we can ask for interference over there, that the people's relationship with Him are strengthening in this period. And this is what I feel as well God wants to use, do with us this afternoon. He wants to strengthen that relationship with, with us, that we are so confused, we're not quite sure what is happening. And then God is saying to us, Trust me. Trust me, my son. Trust me, my daughter. Trust me. 
other strange things what we're doing we've done it a few times we i think completed more or less three puzzles and a puzzle is a strange thing they've got a lot of pieces thousand thousand two hundred and fifty pieces on a bundle on the table and now you've got to get a picture out of it and now you've got to build it in the beginning you do a few logical things you first make the borders around it and then you start filling in the pieces till you at the final hand have got it completed but there are a few things and actually two things which are needed because otherwise you're not going to be able to complete the puzzle the one thing is what is needed is that you must have a picture a picture of how the puzzle should look like at the end if you haven't got that picture it's very difficult to build the puzzle because you do not know where the pieces actually belong and the other is time and time is sometimes a little bit different and difficult um, now we are forced to have a little bit of time but it is happening that time is limited and in the period before the coronavirus and i think in a year time it will be back again normal to where we are but we were before the coronavirus it is a rat race each and every one has got the same problem i haven't got enough time I cannot do what I'm supposed to do. In these few days, we could do what we normally wouldn't even think of, of doing, and that is building a puzzle. And as we were busy with the puzzle, and as I was busy with the sermon, it, I could see a similarity in it, that if we take a look at the world, the world looks for a lot of people at the moment, like a puzzle. We do not actually know who belongs where or what has got to be done. It looks like a puzzle. It's not a thousand or a thousand, two hundred and fifty pieces. It's seven billion pieces of people on this earth which somewhere belong and all have got to link up. We don't know. Because we do not know how this COVID-19, how this coronavirus, is going to be solved and how God is going to solve it we don't know we're asking that question ourselves we say how can it be solved and we've got theories and we've got ways what we think the government has got to do it and we discuss it with other people because if it's one thing what has been discussed quite a lot over the last period then I think it is this coronavirus then it is this COVID-19 but we also take it to our inner room and we bring it to God. We say, God, this is a situation. We do not know how we must get out of this situation. But we bring that situation to you and say, Lord, use us in this situation how you want to use us and what we can do. Because God has got a plan. Because God is the only one who's got an answer for each and every situation. Because God's answer is always the perfect answer. God Almighty, He's got a picture and He's got a time. He's got the two critical things which are needed to see what has got to happen and how has it got to go. And then we must probably ask, but what is God's plan? How does God's plan actually look like? What we know is that God was already there before the creation of heaven and earth. And we know, it's written in the Bible, that's what we trust God for. We're going to be with him in heaven forever and ever after this earth. And in a period between Genesis and Revelations, we've got then those books which are telling us something of God's plan, of what he's revealing to us. An awesome part of God's plan is Abraham. Abraham was 75 years old when God started a plan with him. He made a covenant with him and he spoke to him. And he said to him, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make you a great name. And you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you. 
And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the family of the earth shall be blessed. And he carries on. In Genesis 12 verse 7, he says, Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there Abraham built an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. God has got a plan. He's got a plan and he's revealing that with Abraham. And he's telling him, that piece of ground where you're staying at the moment, your descendants, which were not there at the moment, are going to stay over there. They're going to live over there. And they're going to remain over there. And Abraham replied, and he built an altar to the God who appeared to him. Because he put his trust in God. He trusted God, did what God promised him was going to happen. But then God is also at a certain time saying to him that it's not going to happen directly. It's going to take a little bit of time. And then God said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them for 400 years and all the nation whom they serve I will judge and also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at an old age but in the fourth generation they shall return. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So he's saying to him over there, it's not going to happen now. Your descendants are not going to build houses over here and going to remain over there. No, it's going to happen in 400 years. Something else has got to happen. In the last sentence, what he says over there, but in the fourth generation they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Something had to happen. Something still had to be done before the Israelites could come back and take possession of that land. And why is he saying that? We can read that in Deuteronomy 9 verses 5. And he says to him, it is not because of you, your righteousness, of the uprightness of your heart, that you go into possess the land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, that the Lord your God drives them out before you, that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So something had to happen. And then God says that he's going to drive the wickedness of the nations, he's going to drive them out. And I feel there's a certain similarity at the moment, again, of what is happening in this world. There's a lot of wickedness in the world. A lot of wickedness in London, a lot of wickedness in Utrecht, a lot of wickedness all over the world, where people are moving away from God. And God wants to use us now. God wants to use us now that we can reflect the trust what we've got in God that we can show that to the other people and that they also can start having a relationship with that living God. And what God is doing over here with Abraham is, is, is part of his total plan. Because if the Israelites, if Abraham, or if the Israelites didn't go to, to Egypt and if they didn't come back, then God's prophecy which was over here wouldn't have been fulfilled. It wouldn't have been able to come. God's plan wouldn't have been able to be fulfilled. But God has got a plan which is perfect. Again, like the puzzle, it looks confusing. But God has got that picture, that complete picture of how he wants the world that it should be. So that it, out of those Israelites, when they came back out of Egypt and they went and stayed in the land of Canaan, that at the later stage, that the Messiah, the Redeemer, could be born over there as well. The next person, what I wanted to talk a little bit about, is Joseph. 
If we take a look at Joseph, brought up in an awesome family, wealthy family, everything what he needed was over there. His father liked him. His father liked him actually very much. You nearly can say he liked him too much because he, he put him above his other sons. And that was noted by the other sons. So the other son says, look, the dreamer is coming again. Look, there's Joseph coming again. And then Joseph, the jealousy of his brothers, it happened that they sold him. They sold him for 20 silver pieces. They sold him. And then those people who bought him sold him again to Potiphar. And then in Potiphar, and being in prison afterwards, we can read that God was each and every time with him. Because Joseph was part of God's plan. Each and every one of us are part of God's plan. And Joseph stayed in a relationship with God. Potiphar's wife couldn't distract him. Which is, for a lot of people in nowadays terminology, they would say, well, it's logic, it's acceptable. No. Joseph knew what's God's law, what God wants, and he was obedient to that. So he was with Potiphar, and he was in prison. And at the final end, the chief baker, who initially forgot him, remembered him again. And then he could come. And then he could explain that dream to the Pharaoh. And then the Pharaoh put him in charge. At the age of 30, Joseph was reigning in Egypt. It was only the Pharaoh who was above him. But Joseph was reigning in Egypt at the age of 13. So if we take a look at of what happened between when he left his house to look for his brothers and what happened in between, and then that he is reigning in Egypt, and that the whole of Egypt has got to do what he's telling them to do, because the Pharaoh told the people to do so. We cannot understand it. It looks a little bit awkward to us, but it's part of God's plan, of that perfect plan what God has, of how he's using that situations. Yes, his brothers were sinning. His brothers were selling their brother for 20 pieces of silver. And they were also making a lie to the father and said, most probably an animal who has eaten him, who has eaten him. But God has got a plan. So through the sins of the sons, even if there's evil involved, God takes a situation and he turns it around because he needs it, that the tribe of Judah will be preserved and that the lion of Judah, Jesus, that he can come. Because this weekend, it's all about Jesus. Good Friday, when Jesus died at the cross, and then Sunday, when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, when he conquered death. It has been predicted in the Old Testament so many times of what was going to happen with Jesus, his birth, his death, the resurrection. It has all been mentioned over there. Again, part of that awesome plan that God has. And then we can see also with, with Jesus, there's one or two similarities actually with what Joseph is concerned. Joseph has been sold and Jesus has been sold. Jesus has been sold, has been betrayed by Judas Iscariot for 30 silver pieces. And Jesus also started his ministry at the age of 30. And Joseph started reigning in Egypt at the age of 30. If there's one in the Bible who really can talk about trust, and who is quoting trust so many times, and it is David. It's awesome how this guy is using that, the different words. If you read over there in Psalm 4, verses 5, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There are many psalms written by David, where in the beginning he is explaining a situation, it's a difficult situation, he doesn't know what to do. Then he starts talking with, to God. He's 
fighting actually, is fighting with himself and with God. And at the end of the psalm, he gives all the glory and honor to God. And the word what he uses over there, trust, is the Hebrew word bauta. And bauta has got a few parts which are built into it. And it says that you must trust, that you must be confident and sure, but also that you must be bold. If you trust in somebody, you're not going to keep quiet. You're going to re reveal that. You're going to show that. You're going to say that to other people because you put confidence in that person. And there's something else which is going along with it as well. And that is the word hope. Hope and trust. Because if there's something what God is giving to us, is that there is hope. That there's going to be eternal life along with Him forever and ever. And that is a hope that nothing, that nobody can steal from us. Nobody can take that away from us. That is something which is part of that trust, that trust in me. The second word what David has been using quite a lot as well, is where he says, O Lord my God, in you I put my trust. Save me from all those who persecute me and deliver me. The word what he uses over there is the Greek word kausho. And kausho has got three different parts in it. It has got hope in it, where I spoke about just now, that is also built in the other word trust. Make refuge so that you can shelter, that you can go undercover, that you can get a protection from God and trust. Because you put trust in God. And that is built into that word. Trust doesn't mean that we're not going to have troubles. We are going to have troubles. If we're going to trust God, it's not going to be a cancellation of all the problems. If we're going to put trust in God, it doesn't mean that the coronavirus is going to be sorted out tomorrow. No. But a trust is going to give us something. It's going to give us that hope. It's going to give us that, that thing where we can look to into the future. It gives us life today which is, gives us energy. At a certain time, Paul was also writing, along with Barnabas. And it's written over there in Acts 14. And when they had preached the gospel, that day, the day is then Paul and Barnabas, and Paul and Barnabas had pre preached the gospel to that city, which is Derbe, and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. So he's saying over there, we are going to have tribulations. We are going to have troubles. It is going to happen. We are not secured from it. But we've got that hope. And we've got God the Father who says to us, trust me, which is helping us through this situation, which is helping us to look up and not to look around to the people around us, but that we look up to God. That is where our help is coming from. Because he's got that total picture of how the world should look like and what should happen. Today God is asking us that we should put trust in Him because He's got a plan. He's got a plan for us in the short period what we're living now. But He also has got a plan for the whole spectrum, for the whole period. We don't know when it's going to end. It's going to come back as a thief in the night. Are we praying each and every day that that day can come, that we can be alone with God the Father in heaven forever and ever. God has got a plan, and Jesus is part of that plan. And this weekend, where we're thinking about the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, we are remembered again of God's awesome plan. And actually, I want to say, this weekend, the death and the resurrection is a confirmation of God's plan. It's not part of God's plan. It's actually a confirmation of God's plan. 
God has got a plan. And he's got an awesome plan. If we had to make that plan, we must probably have done it differently. But God is a perfect father. He knows what we as children need. And that he's giving. And that plan he's making. And that's the plan what we can see in Jesus. It's a confirmation of that plan what he has got for us. In a world, we've got some basic principles. And one of the basic principles what I just want to talk about a little bit today is the principle of explaining something to somebody else. And you can only do it if you understand it yourself. We all know if you take a mathematic um, uh, sum that you've got to work out, you must understand it, because if you do not understand it, how are you going to explain it to somebody else? You cannot expect other people to understand something if you do not understand it yourself. And today I feel we've got to put that same over the trust, because we cannot expect other people to have trust in God if we do not trust God ourselves. If we are so involved with the fears which are around the world, that we cannot put our trust in God. How are we going to explain to somebody else, you must put your trust in God, put your trust in God, put your trust in God. And in the meantime, we're running from one fear to the other fear to the other fear. That doesn't work. We've got first got to put it right in our lives. That we put God first that we trust in Him, and then we can also explain it to other people. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, is explaining it very nicely. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. With all of your heart. Not 95%, not 98%, not 99 100%. With all of your heart. Trust in the Lord. Your life can be looking like that puzzle with all the pieces on the table. You say, how am I going to make something through it? Trust in God who made you. And do not lean on your own understanding. Yes, we've got our own ways of thinking. Because we also will say, yeah, but God has got me, given me a brain, so I must use it. Yes, we must use it. But we must still put God first. And in all your ways, acknowledge Him. And He shall direct your path. Because with the path that God is giving to us is part of His plan. It's part of what He wants us to do. And as I was preparing this, this sermon, one of the passes would be completed. We couldn't complete. Because there was one piece missing. One piece wasn't there. And as I was busy with the sermon, I felt that the Lord was saying, there is one person who is not coming to me and is not asking and is not communicating with me. It's a missing piece. And that God wants us all that we should come to Him, that we should be with Him, that we should put our trust in Him so that His total plan can be fulfilled. Not to say that God's plan is not going to realize. It is going to happen. If God spoke to you and you had to do something and you didn't do it, He will tell it to somebody else to do it. So it is going to happen because it's part of God's plan. Rana Bonko also at a certain time also said that God told him, because God told him you've got to go to Africa. He said, God, I haven't got time at the moment. He said, you're the third person who's not obedient. And if God is speaking to us, we've got to be obedient. And if we are in our inner room and we speak to God, and He's revealing something to us, then we've got to be obedient. And if we are speaking to somebody and we feel that the Holy Spirit is telling us that we must share something with that person, then we do it. Sending a message to somebody, then we do it. This is the time that we've got to be obedient, that we can be part of God's plan. 
so that this total plan of which he has got a picture, that it can be fulfilled. The other thing that I spoke about was time. We need to spend time with God. If we're not going to spend time with God, and nobody can say now, in these weeks, that we haven't got time, because there is time, that we can spend time with God, and He said, Father, here I am. I was one which is always busy with my own plans, but here I am, and I want to do what you tell me to do. And I only want to do what you tell me to do. And if we spend time with God, then I guarantee you that God is going to spend time with you. And I'm remembered now, reminded now of a, uh, at a certain time, um, was on a, I think it was on a Saturday morning, and I always had the custom of um, to make a cup of coffee and a cup of tea for me. And Rene, on a Saturday morning, during the week I was working, I was away, and then on a Saturday morning that we would have coffee and tea in bed with some basket, rusks. And I already made the coffee and the tea and I was looking out of the window and I saw the tree and I saw the leaves. And then I started talking. I said, Lord, how is it possible that you as a creator, you've created this beautiful tree, you've created the leaves, even the Chinese people, they cannot make something like that. It's beautiful. It's perfect. How is it possible that you as creator of heaven and earth are spending time with me? I'm just one of those seven billion. Then God said to me, because you are spending time with me. Time is important. You've got to spend time with God. And if we spend time with God, God will spend time with us. We're coming now to the end of the sermon and I feel that the Lord wants to do something today which is maybe not that common to do specifically in the in the type of uh, way that we are at the moment now. But I feel that we've got to do something now, and I'm inviting those who feel that they've got the urge, the need to do it, that we're going to say to the spirit of fear, the time is over. You're not going to steal any longer in my life. And my, let's call it, altar call today is going to be inviting you if you say, yes, I want to send that spirit of fear, even if it's just 2 or 3%, I want to send it away. I want to totally trust in God. Because fear is on the one side, and trust and faith is on the other side. And in between, we shouldn't be. We should be totally with the trust and the faith that God wants to give to us. I'm going to lead you in prayer, and I'm going to ask you to follow me in prayer that we can send the spirit of fear, that we can send it away, and that we can say your time is over, and we can have a smile on our face, because we put trust in God, because he invited us today and said, trust me, trust me, I am the one. Please follow me in prayer, so that we can send away the spirit of fear. And just repeat as I'm praying. Heavenly Father, thank you for your plan. Thank you for your invitation today to trust you, to put our trust in you, not in the things that we can see around us, but in you creator of heaven and earth. Father, when we look around us, we only see fear. The fear is coming very close to us. And fear is even taken off our tongue. And Father, this afternoon, I want to repent of my fear. Fear for the things which I haven't got in control. Fear for the things 
which are going to steal from me, who are going to kill me, who are going to destroy me. Father, I repent of fear. And I thank you that your word says, if you repent, then you will give forgiveness. I thank you for the forgiveness. And I thank you for the authority which you've given us in the name of Jesus Christ. That we now can say to the spirit of fear, go. Spirit of fear, I instruct you now to go. Your time is over. You haven't got any legal right to steal from me any longer. I'm instructing you now to go into the abyss and not to come back in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the freedom that you're giving me now. And thank you, Father, that I can ask you to fill this open space now with your Holy Spirit. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. And if it is necessary that you've got to pray the prayer again this evening, tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening, then you do it. Do not let the enemy steal from you. Because God is a perfect God. He loves us. He wants to give the best to us. And he has got a picture of the total plan. Have an awesome week. And may this week be that you trust him. And that you're going to experience his presence when you are in your inner room and when you speak to him. And if it is necessary, take up your authority that you've got in the name of Jesus Christ. And whatever spirit is stealing from you, you repent and you send that spirit away. That the enemy is not going to steal. That he's not going to steal of that joy. That you can trust. Because God is telling us today, trust me. Have an awesome, blessed week. And be a blessing to the people around you. In Jesus' name.